Hello everybody, welcome to Boxing Science. In this video, I'm gonna be answering a question that I receive a lot across social media, and that is how to plan a training camp. And this is very complicated to a lot of coaches, very experienced coaches as well. There's many times where I've got to sit down and really think about how I'm gonna plan out all the training for each individual athlete. So in this video, I'm basically gonna show you a generic plan of how we plan our 10 week training camp at Boxing Science. Before we start any program for any of our athletes, we've got a range of different important considerations to make uh, before we start putting in different training methods, uh, different loading patterns and everything like that. The first consideration is how long is the training camp? Is it eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12? Maybe even more in this current climate with a pandemic with not many fights going off uh, for our professional boxers. Uh, which is obviously not great for them, but in terms of programming, we've got plenty more time to be working on a range of different physiological adaptations. Uh, but how long the camp is really defines uh, what kind of training methods that we're supposed to be implementing and also the different loading strategies as well. The level of athlete that we're working with, this has an impact on the different kinds of training methods that we can expose them to. Weight making, is a massive consideration to take when implementing different kinds of training methods. You know, is an athlete quite tight to the weight? Can't they afford to put on any muscular hypertrophy? This has an impact on our strength training. Is an athlete starting a little bit too big, a little bit too heavy, as they've got a, quite a sharp weight descent? This is a massive impact on uh, the kind of conditioning methods and the loads that we can actually expose them to. So with uh, fighters, we've got a really, uh, have a see of how uh, steep that weight descent is. What are their training goals? Are they wanting to improve their strength, their speed? Are they wanting to improve their high intensity conditioning? These are all important to, uh, to define what training methods we select. And also, uh, we've got to consider whether an athlete's gonna go away on training camp or they have to travel uh, to a destination. So um, I've worked with athletes that have boxed, in Japan, in America, uh, in Italy, you know, being all over the world with, with boxing and environmental factors have a big impact on their ability to train. When they're traveling, let's say they're traveling over to America, you've got to kind of cancel out one week, um, make sure that your deload is around where they're actually traveling. So this actually, you know, that's like a one week and probably three weeks out from a fight, but that'll impact the loading patterns that we use towards the start of camp. So they're the important considerations. Now I'm gonna show you how to structure a 10 week plan. So now we're gonna start building our training camp. And we always start with a blank canvas. The reason why is we want to uh, start afresh and we also want to reverse engineer the process. And we're gonna be working on four key categories, which is loading, which is how heavy, and light each week is. Boxing, you know, what kind of activity is happening, when, when is uh, the main sparring going to be happening during training camp. Conditioning, the different kind of conditioning methods we use, and also strength training. We want to reverse engineer the process, so we want to be starting on, on week 10 and week nine. What does, what does the latter stages of camp look like? On the loading patterns, we, we have a different categories. We have low, medium, medium heavy, and heavy. And we know that week nine, uh, sorry, week 10 is gonna be low because that is our taper week. So once we put in week 10, which is a low week, obviously, because that's taper week, we, all, we actually start our tapering phase with our conditioning and, and strength methods uh, at week nine. You know, the boxers are um, got high sparring loads, uh, they're uh, quite close to the weight. Last thing that we want to do is be putting in a heavy week on week nine. So we know that this is going to be a medium week. And this is really important because this impacts how we use our three to one loading pattern across the, the uh, remaining eight weeks. So we're going to go back to the start now and we normally, like I said, we, we normally do a three to one loading pattern. However, at the start, I think it's very important to start building that training load uh, a little bit um, 
more gradual uh, because we don't want them spikes in training loads. So this first week is around about like a, a low to medium week because if a, a box is basically starting uh, a fresh training camp, they haven't done any training uh, the week before, uh, we're needing to make sure that the spike in training load isn't that high. So we start off with a medium to low week and then we start building up our three to one loading pattern from there. So we've got medium, medium heavy, then we finish with a heavy week on week four. We then finish with a medium week as a deload and we can have another three weeks of loading. So going back to just above medium, medium heavy, and then our last hard week is on week eight and that's when we start the taper. So you can see that we've got two main peaks to the, our training load and this is a uh, total training load. So that's boxing, conditioning and strength as well. So we're pushing and progressing the load, we're pushing our body and then we're making sure that there's that variation and that reduction in, in total training load to make sure that we're recovering and making them adaptations without overreaching or overtraining. So the first thing to plan training wise is what boxing activity you're doing. Now I'm not a boxing coach so I'm not going to go into any specifics in terms of like technical drills, pad work, bag work, but what I'm going to do is make a suggestion on where to implement your peak sparring weeks. And it's not exactly uh, rocket science because a lot of boxing coaches have been doing this for many years, but I'm just going to give you some sports science justifications around it. Many people towards, the, uh, many coaches implement their peak sparring weeks towards the back end of camp, and this is fantastic. Now the reason why I prefer this for coaches to do is because of their target body mass needs to be between anywhere between 8 to 10% from their target weight. So this is the reason why is because uh, that makes a safe and effective uh, weight making process but also it's going to be the weight that they're likely to rebound to when they step into the ring. If you're working with a professional fighter and they're on the day before weighing, they're likely to put on anywhere between five to 10% of the body mass that they made, uh, made weight the, the uh, day before. So this is where you're gonna uh, replicate uh, the demands of a fight and probably get your best sparring performance here. Now, when you put in sparring towards uh, the start of camp, where they're not as fit, they're a little bit heavier. Uh, this is where injuries can occur and also poor performance. And this will not only affect you physically, but also affect you uh, mentally and psychologically, uh, put you in a kind of bad mood, uh, low on confidence going into these peak sparring weeks. So I'd say putting your harder spars towards the back end of camp rather than the start. And this is also great for an SNC coach to know because if peak sparring is happening here, this affects the kind of conditioning methods, the kind of strength methods that we use in this section and also at the start of camp as well. So it's very important to have that communication with boxing coach to find out when the spars are going to be and what kind of, what kind of time frame that you're going to be doing it in. Um, so yeah. That's what my suggestions are on sparring and managing your boxing training loads. So the next section that we're gonna be talking about is conditioning methods. Again, we're gonna reverse engineer the process and see what we need to fit in towards the back end of training camp. Now, this uh, I call my uh, fight specific zone. So we even use this in strength training where our strength training moves look a lot more like boxing. You know, using med ball punch throws, landmine punch throws, Banded shadow box and we use that same emphasis on our conditioning so we want to work in that red zone but still work in bursts so we'll uh, replicate the rounds let's say three minutes on and one minute off but we work in bursts so like 
uh, maybe like anywhere between 15 and 20 seconds with a 10 to 15 second uh, rest. So this is replicating the demands of boxing, working in the red zones and also working in bursts. The other thing with this is that it's low lactates. So this will have less metabolic costs and less effect on, uh, on sparring and also on um, that, that soreness and that fatigue the next day. So yeah, using Tabata style and using like fight specific hit work, very important within this training phase. Now, the conditioning methods all depends on the training goal of the boxer. You know, we use the lactate profile, we use the 3015 test to determine what kind of fitness uh, protocols that we need to put in place. But I'm gonna go quite generic here and, and use the more popular training methods of boxing science. We start off camp with max effort sprints. So this is the 30 seconds, well before I start, the infamous 30 second max effort sprints. And the reason why we use it here is because they are so challenging and demanding uh, that we need our boxers have a little bit higher carbohydrate intake here. Uh, they need to be fueled, they don't want to be uh, fatigued going into this and also we don't want them to be fatigued after this as well. So we don't want to be doing max effort, 30 second, out, uh, 30 second max out sprints when they're going into their peak sparring phase as well. So because your legs get sore, uh, you're newly tired as well and this will affect your performance in these important spars. So we always start, when we, we're using max effort sprints, we always put that to the start of camp. We then use muscle buffering and different types of muscle buffering as well. So we can either do uh, two minutes on, one minute off, uh, sorry, two minutes on, three minutes off, or we can use our 12 second intervals. We normally put in the 12 seconds uh, preceding uh, the max effort sprints because an athlete is used to uh, producing that force, that speed, that intent, and it's a good transition into muscle buffering phase. As we get uh, further along into camp, when we're going through this peak sparring, we want the same effects of, of muscle buffering, but with reduced metabolic costs. So that is impact forces, uh, that is kind of muscular activation, uh, we're not wanting to get our athletes sore or newly uh, fatigued. So we uh, transition from 12 second intervals into the two minutes. And then this is a good prep because uh, the two minute intervals actually uh, get up a higher heart rate, maybe like 85% to 90% max heart rate. And that's a good transition into the Tabata and fight specific fitness because it would be a bit of a shock to the system if you're only doing is short sharp uh, work on your max effort sprints your muscle buffering sprints as well and then going into uh, working in the red zone so I always find it's better to do the 12 second sprints as a transition from max effort into some two minute intervals and that transitions into your fight specific hit work and like I said there's many different ways that we uh, swap and change this based on the individual and if you want to find out anything more about our conditioning methods we've got a range of different products from ebooks to uh, 10 week conditioning programs when you can learn more about these uh, methods but also start implementing them into your program so the final section that we're going to discuss in this video is strength training again we're going to reverse engineer the program we've got our taper week and also we've got a uh, our week nine where we start bringing down them training loads so this is where we're going to be working on speed and speed strength and this is where we're using jumps throws and fight specific movements like med, med ball punch throws landmine punch throws stuff like that preceding this we want to be kind of going into this quite explosive so 
we work down the force velocity curve, we work more towards max strength at the start of camp, and we use strength speed towards the middle of camp. Now, it all depends on how long the training camp is to how long we actually work on each uh, kind of physiological adaptation. The main concern that I have with max strength training is that uh, residual uh, strength gains last for uh, anywhere between 30 and 35 days. So we're not wanting to stop max strength training too early in camp as we might lose the gains that we've made at the start of camp and the athlete has worked so hard for uh, towards the back end. So I try and maintain max strength training for as long as possible, potentially going towards like four or five weeks away. So we've got max strength here. And then strength speed. Strength speed can be targeted in many different ways. We can use Olympic lifting, we can use loaded jumps, we can use complex training or contrast training, uh, and we can also use uh, velocity-based training as well. This all depends on what the athlete has done in the previous camp, uh, what their strength levels are, and also uh, kind of what their limitations are as well. So. Some of our athletes can do Olympic lifting and some can't. Uh, some people can do a load of jumps and can really excel in that. Some prefer doing the speed lifts and, and the banded lifts as well. So you've got a range of different uh, exercises that you can do. Also, if I've got an athlete that I really feel that they need to do more max strength training, I'd probably do uh, a couple of weeks here where they're still keeping strength in the program. Also, what I'd like to do is to do complex training and contrast before they go into full kind of strength speed. So they're still getting that max strength adaptation that they're taking into uh, the five weeks. So because max strength, you know, I'd say that strength speed, you're getting more bang for your buck, you're getting uh, faster adaptations. We see bigger changes in performance when we use uh, strength speed. When we do max strength, we see very small increments in performance. So when we have a 10 week camp, we're only working on max strength for four weeks. We're only making like one to 5% increases. Whereas like in strength speed, we're making 10 and 15% uh, changes. So what I'm trying to say is, is that a max strength might need a little bit longer. And if that's a specific goal for that athlete, we need to prolong this in a smart way. You know, I don't want them lifting heavy, heavy, heavy all the way and not being explosive. But if, if we've got an athlete that is lacking that max strength, we can prolong it by putting in something like uh, complex training, contrast training, or just uh, lifting with bands, but lifting a little bit heavier. Okay. Hopefully that's given you a good idea. Um, I've got halfway through this video and I've realized kind of how hard it is to go quite generic. Um, whenever I do this periodized planning um, with any of the athletes, I'm sitting down on the laptop and I'm going at it for a good uh, two to three hours um, and really thinking about the individual and thinking about different exercises that we can use. So. It's quite hard to go generic, but hopefully it's given you a good idea to our, our programming methods. Uh, one thing that I will say before I finish is that we always keep speed in the program, whether that's in the conditioning or the strength. And the reason why we're talking about them residual gains in max strength training lasting for 30 days, speed can actually decline uh, at a much quicker rate. So we do uh, plyometrics all the way through the program uh, stuff like pogos, altitude landings, counter movement jumps, loaded counter movement jumps, you know, that takes a massive precedence in our program, okay? So hopefully you've enjoyed this video, hopefully you've taken a lot away and can start implementing them into your programming. If you're wanting any help with your programming, uh, check out theboxingscience.co.uk forward slash products. Uh, go on there, there's a range of different ebooks and programs for you. 
Uh, but if you're wanting to any specific advice, if you're a coach yourself and you're wanting to get better at programming, uh, just drop us a message uh, across our social media, mainly on Instagram, and hopefully I can help you out uh, with your specific needs. Okay, guys, if you're not a subscriber yet, please hit the subscribe button, and hopefully see you on the next video.